Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the workshop uh, Gender and the Latin America Right Wing, Progress and, and Setbacks in Women's and LGBTQ Rights. This is the first workshop, the virtu a virtual workshop uh, of the series Gender Inequalities and Politics, a, a regional dialogue. Thank you all for being here today, and a special thank you to the guest speakers who accepted to join us in this discussion. We were we are very, very happy to have you here today with us. I am Milena Dancibia, and I work as a researcher for the National Scientific and Research Council of Argentina, CONICET, at the Institute of Latin American and Caribbean Studies of the University of Buenos Aires. Here in New York, I am a visiting scholar at ILAS, the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. And well, I want to introduce you to Sol Prieto, who will moderate today's discussion. She's also a researcher for CONICET at the Center of Labor Studies, CEIL, professor at the University of Buenos Aires and San Andres. And she's also at ILAS, Columbia, as an associate research scholar in the Argentine Studies Program. She is the former National Director of Economy, Equality and Gender in the Ministry of Finance. Well, even if it is in a virtual space, we believe this workshop can contribute to enrich not only our academic debates on gender rights, but also our advocacy in this context in which right-wing governments have won elections in different countries from the Americas, and are increasing their power to win upcoming selections in others. Well, these political parties and movements share several common features, such as anti-gender and anti-feminist narratives, denialism regarding gender inequalities and climate change, and a strong anti-intellectual stance that blames universities and scholars for promoting a woke culture. Also, demographic replacement theories as pointed by these narratives as the cause of all social problems. In other countries where these movements are not present with these exact theaters, but with exacerbated militarization policies such as Venezuela and El Salvador, setbacks and reactions against women and in communities can also be observed. All of these narratives have a clear impact on women's and LGBTQ lives by rolling back basic rights such as abortion, reproductive rights, and social policies related to the care economy. This particularly impacts women and LGBTQ individuals from low-income sectors, migrant communities, rural areas, as well as Black and Indigenous populations. populations. So the goal of this workshop today is to collectively map and analyze the current situation in, the, in, the, in these countries, Latin America and the US, regarding the advancements of rights of women and LGBTQ rights uh, community, as well as the setbacks observed following the assumption of right-wing or extreme right-wing governments. It also intends to be an opportunity to identify and discuss collective resilience strategies. The idea is to address the relationship between gender and anti-right and right-wing governments and movements in an international and comparative perspective to contribute to the debate on how to tackle gender inequalities. Well, we want to thank you, the institutes that sponsored the event, ILAS, IEALC, CEIL and FUNDAR from Argentina, and students associations that help us to make this event possible, uh, Latin American Studies Association, WIL, GPPS. And well, before we, began, uh, be we begin our discussion, uh, allow me to introduce our guest speakers. Well, their, <clears throat> their vast expertise and extensive contributions to the field of gender studies make them invaluable voices in today's conversation. I will share brief bios, although I'm sure many of you are already familiar with their remarkable backgrounds. Their long trajectories speak volumes about their dedication to advancing gender equality and LGBTQ rights in the Americas. Well, first, Jasmine Argan is director of the Specialization of Gender and Public Policy and senior lecturer in discipline in international and public affairs. She is also a member of the faculty advisor board of the Institute for Global Politics, of the Executive Committees of the University's Institute for Research on Women, Gender and Sexuality, and Committee on Global Thought, 
and is the co-convener of the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Council at Columbia University. Her recent work has focused on the nexus between attacks on gender rights and illiberal regimes and movements, and on the emergence of an international market in reproductive services and the transformations of motherhood. Then we have Eleanor Faur. She's a sociologist and holds a PhD in social sciences at Flaxor, Argentina. She's full professor at the National University of San Martin and researcher at Instituto de Desarrollo Económico y Social Argentina. She has led UNFPA, Argentina's country office, for almost seven years and collaborated with different UN agencies as a gender and human rights specialist. She is the author of Juggling Women in an Unequal Society in an Unequal Society, Child Care in the 21st Century. She teaches and researches on gender and socioeconomic inequalities and public policies in Latin America, with special focus on the political and social organizations of care and comprehensive sexuality education. Flavia Miroli is a full professor of political science at the University of Brasilia and currently the Bacardi Eminent Scholar in Latin American Studies at the Center for Latin American Studies of the University of Florida. She is a senior researcher for the National Observatory of Women in Politics of the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies. She was a member of the international expert groups that prepared the reports for the 64th and 65th, 65th Commission on the Status of Women of the United Nations 2019 and 2020. She is also the author of many books on gender and democracy in Brazil and Latin America, such as Gender Neoconservatism and Democracy with Maria Machado and Juan Bajone, 2020, and Gender and Inequalities, the Limits of Democracy in Brazil, 2018. And Veronica Subillaga is a Venezuelan, Venezuelan sociologist she holds a PhD, a PhD in sociology from the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium. She's currently professor at the Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas and is the Tinker Visiting Professor 2024 in Ilas, Colombia. She has devoted her herself to studying urban violence in Latin America, youth gang violence in Caracas, gender and public policy. In recent years, she has combined academia with public impact on social and armed violence advocating for arms control and disarmament, disarmament public policy in her country. Currently, she is actively promoting discussions about the search for justice vis-a-vis -vis police violence in Venezuela. Okay, I will, I will uh, leave now uh, you with Sol that will moderate the conversation. Yeah, very short. Thanks again, all of you panelists and to all of the people online. We're more than 60 people at the moment. So to facilitate meaningful dialogue, we will ha we have chosen a conversational format. It will consist of three rounds of questions with each of you having five minutes to share your reflections and perspectives on the assigned topic. While these questions serve as guide, we encourage you to illuminate aspects you find pertinent, whether referring to your country or to the broader region. After the questions, we will share some questions and comments by the audience. So please, everyone feel free to use the question and answer section to share your questions and comments with, with us. So the first question is, what have been the main progresses and backlashes in women's and LGTB rights in the last two decades in Latin America and in North America. How is the situation of gender rights in the region compared to other regions of the world? Please feel free to discuss about your country of interest or the broader region. And remember, you have five minutes, so I'll give the word to Flavia Viroli. Thank you, Sol. So I just want to quickly thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. It's a pleasure for me to be with the colleagues and be part of this conversation. So um, I will uh, very quickly set what I see at the co as the context and the connections to uh, the disputes over democracy as well, when I think of progress and backlash. So um, in Latin America, I see the progress in rights and effective participation connected to the new structures of opportunities that were offered by the transition to democracy in many countries in the 1980s mainly, and then the turn to the left or pink tide 
in many countries of the region in the first decade of the 21st century, starting from, from uh, late 1990s and then the first decade. So progresses can be tracked by following the achievements of movements in promoting law and public policy on gender-based violence, electoral quotas to expand women's representation in parliaments, and reproductive and sexual rights. The democratic cycle opened opportunities for feminist movements to press for the adoption of gender policy machineries and expand egalitarian gender perspectives across policy areas, such as health, social security, education, and housing. The adoption of cash transfer policies, which have uh, uh, women as beneficiaries, was also important in many countries in the region. Adding to that, from a social demographic perspective, we should recognize tremendous changes in the access of girls and women to education, participation in paid workforce, along with the new possibilities represented by the significant drop in birth rates and the oldest average age for marriage and first pregnancy. In short, I understand that we can say that the political and social democratization that many countries in the region went through was gendered, as it redefined the meanings and the scope of democracy and citizenship. However, advancements in laws and policy and social changes varied across countries, and their effects were often divergent in lines of class and race. So I'll just comment that very quickly. So they varied across countries for reasons related to capacity of the state, type of party in government, the strength of feminist and LGBT movements vis-a-vis -vis religious conservative forces, um, stressing here that the capacity to make alliances beyond these specific movements has been pointed out by many researchers as an important factor. Uh, their effects were divergent, as I said, in lines of class and race, also for a number of factors, including the lack of policy simultaneously addressing gender and class inequalities, to mention Fernando Figueira and Juliana Franzoni's work. They remind us that the sexual division of work is a persistent obstacle to women's access to income in the region. Uh, another factor is the limited capacity of states as the result of historical processes and new liberal austerity measures and changes in the labor market that simultaneously corresponded to an increasing participation, but also a deregulation of rights and guarantees. I'll just say a few words on the backlash for now. So first, I see the backlash corresponding to a reorganization of conservative religious forces and right-wing and far-right alliances, targeting political and social democratization. I'd like to say that it's not only specific issues that we are targeting. It takes different forms, campaigns against gender rights framed as the defense of families and children, the active proposal of bills and judicial action to revert or prevent progresses in reproductive and sexual rights, the mobilization of parents and communities against debates that criticize hierarchical and violent gender and racial orders, including now the ban of books. Backlash actors organize transnationally and locally in alliances that have a strong participation of religious conservative organizations, but are not limited to them. They activate elite partners to counter or prevent reproductive and sexual rights in Congress and the judiciary, and they mobilize voters by strengthening frame alignments based on fear, resentment, and insecurities. They increasingly talk of defending a family order as they advocate for deregulating rights and dismantling distributive policy. When I discussed the progresses, and this is just to wrap up, I said that political and social democratization was gendered in terms that expanded the meanings of citizenship, although in varied degrees. Now I would say that the backlash is intimately connected to openly anti-democratic perspectives participating in attempts to redefine democracies through illiberal values and authoritarian arrangements. The restriction of citizen rights and the demos is justified by the idea of protecting the family, capturing resentments against the shortcomings of liberal uh, democracies. So I would stop here so I don't exceed my yeah, time. Yeah, perfect. I mean, it's perfect. So now we'll give the floor to Jasmine. 
Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for this, for the invitation. And I, uh, I'm really building on Flavia's comments. It should be clear that I'm not an expert on Latin America and I don't come from Latin America. And so my scope of knowledge is really pitched at another level. And the level that I would like to address is more the institutional global level of um, gender of gender politics. But the question stands at a global level too. And I don't mean just in the sense that it stands because when we look at a whole sequence of countries in different places, we see phenomena which are, if they're not identical, they have strong uh, elective affinities one with the other, which is in fact the case. And because we also see learning patterns that connect the experiences in one country to the experiences in another. But because actually the, the what I'm particularly interested in is that at the international level, that is at the global institutional level, we see phenomena that are very similar to the ones that Flavia just described. And what I'm struck by is the dual movement, which is on the one hand, and it depends of course on what your scope, your temporal scope is, how far back are we going to go when we look for signs of progress and also when we look for indications of backlash. We're about to come up to the 30th anniversary of the Beijing uh, conference and of the Beijing platform for action. And that seems to me to be a good sort of starting point for two reasons. One, because many of the progressive developments that we have seen, and we have seen many at a global institutional level, are in some sense related to that platform for action, to what I have called in other places, the Beijing settlement, i.e. the general framework of, that put together rights and I, concepts of rights and concepts of institutional development in order to pursue an agenda of gender equality. That was an agenda of gender equality that was very much skewed towards women's rights and less took less into account, much less into account, uh, issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity, but it nonetheless set a framework in which there seemed to be a general agreement on some fundamental issues. What was that agreement? That agreement was dual. It was that the, the tendency ought to be towards equality and non-discrimination on the basis of gender, the use, the word gender was repeated throughout Beijing, and it was repeated in all of the documents afterwards. It had already been used before, but it was repeated in all of the documents afterwards. Gender became a guiding concept of those debates. And that there should be institutional developments that corresponded, that could support this normative framework. And so what we've seen in the last decades has gone from the creation of UN Women, for example, to the agreements to regional agreements on women's rights, to more normative development related to CEDAW, to the norms regarding gender that were incorporated into the International Criminal Court, and so on and so forth. We've had a really massive institutional and normative development. And at every step of the way, the normative developments have actually also been accompanied by institutional developments. So that there isn't a UN agency today that doesn't have at least one office or one site that is specifically dedicated to either women's issues or gender issues more generally. So that so many governments have set up women's rights machineries so that you can sort of go down the line so that the courts and the International Criminal Court has gender advisors and has women rights advisors and so on and so forth. The counter tendency is equally international and equally mobilized at the global level. It's true that it focuses on issue or it presents itself as being pro-family. It's essentially averse to and opposed to gender rights. It, it's actually fundamentally opposed to the concept of gender. 
to a certain understanding of the concept of gender, actually, because it doesn't have to be opposed to all of them, but to a certain understanding of the concept of gender. And that's why we see in country after country after country that the campaigns against women's rights or against LGBTQI plus rights are accompanied by attacks on the notion of gender ideology. This way of saying that the notion of gender is an ideological notion, not a sociological notion, not a scientific notion, but an inherently political notion. And that therefore the appropriate, it is appropriate to respond to it with a correspondingly political mobilization, because it's not something that you take and you disprove scientifically. It's something that you reject as a political framing. And we see that consistently in so many in so many countries. But all of this, and I, I don't want to, I think that this all does two things. One is there's an institutional agenda that goes with it. And there are a series of characteristic moves that go from defunding the agencies and the institutions for gender equality to simply dismantling them. And often to what with, um, several co-authors when we were looking at what was happening to gender studies, we call despecification, which is in other words, to take the machinery that is supposed to be for gender equality and to drown it in, for example, ministries of the family or ministries of children's mm -hmm. affairs and so on and so forth. What does all of this do? That's I think the, the fundamental question and I agree very much with Flavia's framing, this is about questions of citizenship, and it's really about the conception of a democratic citizenry. And I think that, so for me, conceptions of citizenship today have to be articulated at a dual level. That is both at a supranational and also at a national level. And that we have to think about what citizenship means at those two levels. But what is happening is, I think, a mobilization against, or mobilization in order to reassert a model of the modal citizen that doesn't allow for internal differentiation and certainly doesn't allow for internal conflict. And that therefore is against gender rights, but it's also about race. It's also about ethnicity. It's often also about religion, actually. It's about everything that disarticulates this, this non-pluralistic, non-liberal idea of the citizen so that you really mobilize the state apparatus and they're trying to mobilize the international apparatus in concert with the state apparatus to create this one uniform, compact model of the citizen. And that's what I think is actually going on. And so you, you know, it's against, yes, it's against women's rights. Yes, it's against LGBT. The question we have to ask ourselves is why is it so useful rhetorically? What is the work that women or that LGBTQI+, plus, or that gender is doing in this political rhetoric? What is the work of gender from a right-wing point of view? And then we'll have the answer to why this is happening, I think. Wow, well, that's amazing. Thank you very much, Jasmine. So now I'll give the, the word to Veronica. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Sol and uh, Milena. It's a pleasure to be with you here. So when Sol uh, told me about this conversation, one of my first uh, reactions was coming from Venezuela too. Uh, I just told her that, well, the threat is not coming only from the right. Yeah. Coming from Venezuela, um, there is this backlash in women's right um, in the context of a theoretically uh, left-wing uh, government. But the thing is, 
beyond far uh, beyond um, uh, right wing and uh, left wing there is this thread that is uh, represented by the expansion of authoritarian and militarized governments in the region for instance despite the very hostile exchanges between nicolas maduro the president of venezuela and nayib bukele president of El Salvador, their politics are very similar in terms of um, in terms of this authoritarian turn uh, of of their politics. So, being myself a researcher focused on urban violence in Latin America, but especially in Venezuela, I would like to focus in this militarization turn in citizen security policies um, that represents a serious threat to women's rights, but also to young men and dark skinned uh, young men in, in, in the poor neighborhoods of Venezuela. And security has become very important because it has um, become the agenda and the center of the state activity. So security and order has become an hegemonic discourse and that, that has become the center of the state activity, marginalizing, marginalizing women's struggles, women claims for right. So departing from that uh, militarization of uh, citizen security, I would like to say that we have seen spectacularly these days in El Salvador, but we have seen also in Brazil, in Venezuela, and we saw this weekend in, in Argentina um, what happened in, in Rosario and then this presence of the military in the streets and this spectacularity of the state presence and this performance of a state presence to show power and uh, the claim for legitimacy. So in this frame, I will say that there is a very important differential pattern of human rights violation depending on gender. So we can see the massive killing, the first, the massive incarceration of young, dark skinned uh, men in the poor barrios. And at the same time, we have the presence of women, even as mothers or are their wives. And we have all these accounts of this differential pattern of, uh, of violence focused on women, for instance, in, the, in all the reports of the independent fact-finding mission of um, human rights, and the United Nations from Venezuela, they precisely um, highlighted this pattern of the differential pattern of discrimination. For instance, um, police forces were over concentrated on in, in young men, but at the same time, women were humiliated and were um, aggressed as being their mothers and claiming for their rights. This victimization has to be seen also in the after effects experienced by women. For instance, we see this uh, victimization, re-victimization of women that are claiming for justice. Um, this is also a point that has been highlighted in Brazil, for instance, the, the work of um, Kristen Smith has highlighted how women are suffering the after effect of the killing of their sons. And they are being again re-victimized re when they are claiming for justice. Also in the frame of El Salvador, we could see, I, I could continue the, the, the pictures of women outside the prisons in Venezuela. And there was this symmetrical images of mothers and wives of young men from the Maras in El Salvador that were massively put into prison. So 
also in El Salvador, the stigmatization, criminalization, and the burden of care for women relatives of prisoners have been denounced before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights um, during a special hearing entitled Differential Impact of Prison on, on the Lives of Women Relatives of Persons Deprived of Liberty in the Americas. So I will close here by saying that this militarization is representing a serious backlash to citizenship, of course, and I totally agree with Flavia and Jasmine that this is a matter of citizenship, but specifically and in a very special forms in women's rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. And now I'll give the floor to Eleonor. Well, thank you very, very much for this invitation. It's so, so nice, so good to, so inspiring to listen to all of you, all of you. So uh, I will refer to Argentina. And first of all, I would like to refer very briefly to some characteristics of the Argentinian context. Uh, as you know, it's an upper middle income country in the south of the continent whose average variables high deep socioeconomic, ethnic, racial, and gender inequalities. <clears throat> we suffered a military coup by the end of the 70s that had serious political consequences, but also uh, transform, deeply transformed the social structure uh, of the country, intensifying po poverty and social inequalities. The democratic recovery in 1983 representing a kind of refounding cleavage in terms of democratization of society and the configuration of what Ernesto Seman characterized as the human rights regime. And he, cons he considers, and I agree with him, that at this point, this regime is coming to an end. Within this context of the democratization well, that was built along 40 years of an uninterrupted democracy regime, women's and LGBTIQ rights had been gradually conquered along all these years. In the last two decades, we conquered sexual and reproductive rights, including the right to free abortion, laws on gender-based violence, access to egalitarian marriage, that is same-sex and or trans people's marriages, a Gender Identity Act, very progressive, that recognizes the right to gender identity as for self-perception. We also move forward with comprehensive sexuality education rights and public policies defined from a gender diversity and human rights approaches. All these made Argentina a kind of spotlight in Latin American context when analyzing gender and LGBTIQ rights. These achievements were driven also by a powerful feminist and queer movement with massive annual meetings of women and diversities, as well as marches and mobilizations with specific demands all throughout the year. Focusing on social and economic rights that are crucial for women, there was an advance in launching a gender office in financial and economic ministry and care policies, debates, and specific programs, uh, though we were not able to institutionalize a national care system or universal care policies. In all, I would like to say that all this expansion of rights for women and diversity uh, along these two last decades did not move at the same pace as the distributive agenda. Rather, it was consolidated in parallel to what Nancy Fraser calls a cannibal capitalism, a system that divorces the bodies of women and the resources of the planet, of the planet sorry, and exposes a society that has not managed to overcome the critical levels of poverty and inequality inherited from the military dictatorship. I am mentioning this because I think this is a crucial point on what we are seeing now in Javier Millet's uh, policies in the libertarian government. So in December, last December, we celebrated 40 years of democracy mm -hmm. with this bad news, terrible news of a radical right-wing leader, Javier Millet, taking over the national administration and willing to retrace all the achievements ob uh, obtained 
along these years and refound the very basis of society and economy. So we are nowadays going through all these processes that I uh, will deep on in the next uh, round. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I don't know if I interrupt you. No, no, I was just saying that we have, we, I will, I will deep on the, on this direction of kind of linkage of anti-gender rights, anti-gender movement rights, and going uh, against all these social uh, movements and, and defending social and economic rights. I mean, this is the characteristic for me of the new libertarian government. That's amazing. Thank so that's, you very, thank you. very much, Eleonor. So now we'll pass to the second question, which is what role, I'm sorry, that's your time. <laughs> there we go. What role do you think the gender policies played in the last two decades? And what were the main challenges they faced? How were gender policies affected by these governments of leaders such as Trump, Bolsonaro, Milley, among others? What potential risk for women and LGTB might arise in the context of right-wing or authoritarian governments? And which social groups are most likely to be affected? Again, feel free to discuss about one specific gender policy or more. And please remember, again, you have five minutes, although you're all very <laughs> following the, the, the directions. So now I'll give the word again to Eleanor. Now we'll go backwards. Okay, thank you. Well, gender policies actually played a very significant role during the last two decades and uh, and with a lot of um, different obstacles and disputes uh, on, on these kind of policies that were had been uh, overcome step by step. Though, even though the arrival of the new government uh, threatens all these policies and, and even goes beyond the gender policies. I will refer to three different dimensions in which anti-gender actions are now be taking place. I, I will remember the audience that uh, Millet's government has been uh, in place for 100 days. I mean, so it's a very, very new uh, government and we are analyzing all these processes in, in a real time. So the three uh, dimensions are, first, the anti-gender rights policies and measures. Uh, and the second one is a cultural battle. I think all these uh, are really similar to the different uh, processes in different countries where, uh, where ultra-right uh, movements are in place. And the third one, which I think it's very more characteristic from the Argentinian uh, situation or context, is trying to dismantling all the community care networks led by poor women in their territories. So firstly, with regards to the measures of, of the anti-gender measures, the government dismantled the Ministry of Women, Gender and Diversity that was created in the last government and reduced to a very, very slight, uh, to a minimal portion, the budget for gender policies. Uh, they prohibit the inclusive languages and all the gender perspective in national administration, taking, making very clear that the gender concept, as Jasmine was saying, is kind of concentrating all these uh, ideas of what is ideological, political, etc. So the government also closed the National Institute Against Discrimination. And another me uh, measure that affects women's rights was the elimination of pension retirement for housewives, which was justified by point pointing out that it's women's responsibility to raise and care for their families. So that, those were some of the measures. As for the cultural battle, uh, there is a continuous attack on female journalists, I mean, a, a, a social attack to female journalists, artists, and in a more general term, an attack on feminism and gender perspectives. 
In this sense, the government resorts to the typical repertoires of the conservative extreme, extreme right regarding the attack of gender ideology in schools, in the media, in universities, and so on. The idea of school indoctrination, the invitation to, to parents groups to, uh, to speak uh, against the indoctrination, and the claiming, the claiming that abortion is a crime, and so on. A language of hate and abuse is being installed in different forums and social media, media by the government, uh, thus allowing it to circulate in a common way in the everyday life. There is a clear intention to discipline all of us and to frighten every person who dares to challenge this discourse. All this uh, attack and, and um, discourses on gender, against gender and feminists, are being seen in the, at the national forums as Davos, as the uh, convention of uh, Republic convention in, in the United States, etc. Now the third issue intertwines the attack against feminisms and social movements, movements and attempts to dismantle the fabric, the very fabric of care in poor communities. This this is maybe a, a, a bit more complex to explain in a few minutes, but I, I will try, as I think, as I said, that it's a singularity of Argentinian context. Uh, I said that poverty and, and socioeconomic inequality is a long trend in the country, even though the acute economic crisis that, are, that we are experiences, experiencing since, since Millet took over is of unprecedented scope. Households have had to cut their expenses abruptly. The estimate made by a univer Catholic University is of an increase in poverty of 50 points in just two months, now exceeding 57% of people living below the poverty line. In poor neighborhoods and in slums, community kitchens and childcare centers are run by thousands of women who used to receive a minimum income from the government, in addition to their current work in kitchens, all these women, usually accompanied women who suffer gender-based violence, need access to abortion, and different uh, access to policies on gender. The libertarian government first suspended food delivery to these canteens and kitchens, and then, then they cut the income support for community care workers, 80% of which are women. These measures constituted a brutal attack against women from popular sectors that put sustainability of life at risk. In a few words, we can say that denigrating feminisms calling them totalitarian, totalitarian, guilty of inciting gender ideology, is a trait that is repeated in radical right-wing governments around the world. In our country, this discourse is accompanied by the attack against grassroots organizations and movements. And I think it is precisely at this intersection where an alternative political response is being or can be emerged. Gene, based on the politicization of a feminist ethics of care. So I finish with this at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. That's a great proposal. You're talking about so many topics. So now I'll give the, the floor to, because you're you're kind of, uh, of uh, preparing us for the third question, but we're still on the second one. So we'll ask uh, Veronica right now to answer the second question. Yes, well, I will say I will uh, talk here, especially about Venezuela and maybe um, El Salvador. But the problem in um in um oh, overtly militarized context is that uh, women's uh, struggles become so marginalized. So despite the fact that women are massively present in the labor force and um, bureaucracy, um, there is definitely a substantial debt vis-a-vis uh, -vis equality for women. For instance, 
uh, at the beginning of uh, Hugo Chavez's government, he presented himself as being feminist. But feminist, um, when breaking down bureaucracy, there was the most traditional division of positions in the state bureaucracy. I mean, men when were in the higher positions and women were only present in the different programs that were associated to, uh, to the ethics of care of children of um, and the most vulnerable populations. So there is this um, also an important aspect is that there is this absence of gender perspective in the debate. So in Venezuela, we are experiencing really a backlash in women's agenda. For instance, um, violence against women is not part of the debate, even though we have a law, of course, but um, but in 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 real terms, we are not discussing uh, about sexual violence, less the right to abortion. So the agenda has been um, captured or monopolized by first the political issue and then the polarization. So women's struggles are definitely marginalized. But then also their women are underrepresented in the political spectrum and also in leadership positions, for example, even though in the last elections, uh, women in the totally women represented at least 46% of the candidates for, for government and municipality positions. Well, women were especially present in the low ranks and less present in the high ranks. So um, all this to say that uh, definitely there is this backlash in, in women's um, fights and struggles in agenda in such a polarized and militarized uh, government. I will leave it here. Thank you very, very much, eh, Veronica. So and now I'll give the floor to Flavia. Thank you again, Sol. Uh, so I will draw from the Brazilian context now more specifically because um, I think it's uh, important when we talk about the backlash to distinguish levels and effects. And Brazil has become a case for a backlash implemented very openly by a uh, national uh, government, by the, the, the executive, uh, by the executive on the national level. So uh, thinking of the levels, I think that we could talk about the backlash uh, as we discuss transnational campaigns, as we discuss changes uh, in public opinion, in electoral cleavages, as we discuss how these changes could affect law and policy, as well as how the campaigns could affect law and policy. Uh, also, we could think of a backlash by discussing whether there were effective setbacks uh, and how they were implemented through the judiciary, for example, as in the US, uh, it's the case, right? But this has not been really the reality in most South American countries and Latin America in general. Uh, to the moment where the judiciary has remained relatively independent in many countries under majoritarian conservative alliances uh, in Congresses that were trying to implement setbacks. So, uh, but also like Congresses, it's interesting because this is, would also be uh, a, a way to, to, to really uh, uh, produce setbacks. But what we actually see is that we have had more drafts than bills approved that were capable of reverting rights. And uh, so it's interesting to think of why it has been like that in many countries so far. So I think that's something that we can discuss to think about resistance, but also what are they interested in? Are they sometimes they are not really interesting interested in reverting 
uh, rights, or maybe they were not strong enough, like they did not have the political strength uh, for that. And then we could also think of uh, uh, a case uh, such as the Brazilian, uh, in which the backlash is really installed through measures by the executive and what happens then. So I will just very quickly talk about the case. So um, Brazil is a case of an official uh, anti-feminist perspective installed as uh, national politics. And uh, I think now we have Argentina as well, and we're going to be able to compare. Eleonora, this is going to be, it's not interesting uh, in, in, in feminist terms, but in terms of research, it's going to be interested, it, interesting. So, uh, so Jair Bolsonaro, the far-right president, had an official anti-feminist platform, which was backed by the plural conservative alliance that he had. Um, I would like to just say a few words about the use of the concept of backlash, as there is a discussion about that. I, I keep using the concept of backlash. I think it is an important concept, uh, but I, I do not mean that there is a backlash because they limit their action to blocking actions or just reacting against actions. As these movements, they promote their own gender politics. And I think that uh, uh, Eleonore uh, gave us some uh, information about that in Argentina that is very interesting. This is like, they are implementing a kind of gender politics. Uh, they play into political platforms that could take them like closer to the less plural society that they wish to produce uh, by promoting a kind of gender politics. So what happened in the case of Brazil? I think Brazil in the terms that uh, Yasmin had brought is a case of this specification as like the Ministry of uh, Policy for Women became a Ministry of the Family, Women and Human Rights. But it was interesting because they, point, they appointed as ministries and secretaries of state, conservative Catholic and evangelical activists. So they installed a broad anti-feminist politics at the own uh, at the, at the place where feminist politics had been developed before, so the same structures were used to promote anti-feminist politics. How did they do that? They dismantled policy by interrupting or defunding existing initiatives. They reframed policy by replacing the focus on women's rights and autonomy for family-centered narratives, and they undermined the implementation of international agreements. For example, by excluding the UN Millennium Sustainable Developmental Goals from official documents under the justification that they promoted foreign interests and, of course, gender ideology. Uh, I will also give some more specific examples as I think they can illustrate the kind of uh, work that they did to promote an alternative gender uh, politics. This is from a, a research that I I conducted uh, with uh, Dr. Luciana Tatajib and Dr. Deborah Quintela. So public policy to fight violence against women was defunded as new partnerships with churches and pro-family organizations were established. So it was defunded and the funds went other way, uh, to other organizations, to alternative organizations. Violence was reframed as males deviant behavior that could be addressed by initiatives to strengthen the family. So it was indeed included as one of the main issues in a new transversal policy to strengthen the family, coordinated by a Catholic woman lawyer connected to ultra-conservative organizations such as the Opus Dei, the Polish Ordo Iuris, and the far-right networks linking Brazil to Central Europe. So it was not only sexual rights, reproductive rights. Now, just one more example, policy to reduce teenage pregnancy was reframed to the, as, de, as policy to decrease early sex risk, as the offer of contraceptive methods by public health services was reduced and measures were taken to limit the offer of legal abortion in the cases that are uh, exceptions to the criminal law in Brazil. Ministers were directly involved in spectacularized actions to stop doctors from realizing abortions in 10 and 11 year old girls. The Ministry of Health produced an official booklet 
to guide policy denying the existence of legal abortion, although the law had not been changed. So this kind of paralegal uh, official action was also in place. They, they were not able to change laws. They were not able to, uh, or didn't really want to approve drafts that reverted rights. And I think this is important and I will just very quickly uh, say why they weren't able to change laws to, 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 uh, have, uh, to produce setbacks in law. So one uh, reason I think is that feminist and anti-racist movements had a systematic role in denouncing and bringing to public knowledge what was happening. In some cases, they actually managed to reverse the actions. This is the kind of the booklet that I mentioned, for example. Secondly, I think that one factor, one important factor were, was that we had a constitutional court that positioned itself in favor of fundamental rights from an individual perspective, from a Beijing platform perspective in a way, uh, Yasmin, you know, like understanding fundamental constitutional rights as uh, gendered uh, and including uh, sexual rights. So it, for example, outruled the movement school without party project that had been approved in municipalities in the state to ban uh, discussions on gender uh, in school, uh, in schools in Brazil. And just finally, I think that one factor also was the partisan political coalition formed to limit it, a multi-partisan political coalition formed to limit Bolsonaro's authoritarian politics by denouncing, judicializing, and establishing alliances to bar specific measures or to expose potential violations of the constitution and human rights in Congress. So maybe if Bolsonaro had a second term, this would not have been enough. But for a first term, these three factors, I think they were very important to limit the effects of an anti-feminist uh, uh, politics coming from the executive, the national executive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flavia. So now we'll listen to Jasmine. All right, so, I, so I'm going to answer this question briefly because so much terrain has already been covered, but also because some of the things that I that I said last time apply here. But I'd like to do two things. One is to bring back the um, something that I, Ver Veronica pointed this out earlier, but it is that the left-right divide doesn't apply so cogently in this context. And what I'm especially thinking of right now is the way in which, and I don't think, but please correct me if I'm wrong, it, I'm especially thinking about the way in which there is a right-wing feminism that developed in Europe that's been quite vocal, that was especially very vocal at the time of the major moral panic that developed over the question of immigration. And that consisted in a kind of feminist, a, a xenophobic feminism that allied itself very strongly to right-wing movements. It's an anti, it was an anti-immigrant, it was in particular an anti-Muslim movement. But the basic idea of it was not, let's return to a traditional femininity, but rather, we need to defend against this external threat to our values by affirming our state sovereignty, by developing a nationalist agenda, because we need to defend the values of female embodiment, of female, uh, of female non-subordination. So... I just want to remind us that there's another voice here or there's another set of voices and that they are important voices. It's also the case that we've had a series of um, conservative liberal or liberal conservative leaders who have emerged, some of them very conservative, and that are women. 
and for whom being women is not a contradiction to the platforms that they espouse. That's true for Marine Le Pen. It's true for Giorgia Meloni, who's an unmarried mother. It's true you, you can go down the line and you will find many women who are representative of a kind of emancipated femininity who actually endorse policies, some of which we would associate with a feminist agenda, many of which we would not. But it's I, I just want to bring that aspect of it back into, into the agenda. The other thing that I want to say is that at the level, at the global institutional level that I'm particularly interested in right now, I think that two um, consequences that are worth mentioning are these. A, the risk of paralysis in the negotiation of new instruments and treaties to advance rights. So for the last at least two decades, uh, at least decade, sorry, it has been impossible to have an, a real international meeting, to have anything that would resemble a fifth UN women uh, conference, whether it's on women's rights or on gen certainly on gender rights. But because of the fear that is a reasonable fear in so many of the liberal states and in so many that this will only lead to a rollback in our rights that in other words the beijing settlement will be will come unglued that paralysis is very very real it's what means that for example from the perspective of lgbtqi plus rights even though we've had significant advances on the normative plane and we've also had significant institutional advances with, for example, the appointment of an, a, um, an independent expert on SOGI issues. Each appointment, I believe, has become more contested. The last one was highly contested. And we don't know whether that's something that's going to continue. So mm -hmm. one direct if effect that I see is a risk of normative and institutional paralysis. From a normative point of view, when the Trump administration was in power, it conducted a serious campaign against the use of the word gender in any documents, in any international documents, not just national, in any international documents. And it conducted a very serious campaign, which was successful in many instances, for the elimination of any, for the um, prohibition of any reference to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I think one thing to think about is what all of this means and what it portends in terms of a, a in terms of future development. The second thing that I'd like to say is, I asked earlier, what is the work that gender does, and Part of what I think that work is, is that by, in a, in a common sense and what has become the common understanding of the word gender, which divorces gender roles and gender identities and gendered ways of being from sexed bodies, it has had the paradoxical effect of actually highlighting, maybe it's an effect, maybe it's just something that would have happened anyway, in my mind, it's a paradoxical effect of actually highlighting the centrality of the sexed body in political discourse and in, and in institutional politics. And that's related. I don't want to establish a cause. I don't want to suggest a causal relationship because I don't know exactly how it would go. But it seems to me that that's related to why we've had a couple of foci, three foci actually, of, if you like, uh, repressive activity. One is on abortion and abortion rights. Here in this country, that's absolutely evident. The second is on violence against women. That's more evident, I think, in the norms in perhaps some other country, in other places, less so in the United States. 
but in Russia, for example, in many other contexts in which the penalties have been diminished, in which the standards of proof are questioned and so on and so forth. And in the uh, tendency of certain governments to want to get out of and to criticize significantly the regional conventions that focus on issues of violence against women. So Istanbul, and I, I see now also Belém do Pará might be coming under attack. And the third reason why the sexed body um, or the third way in which the sex body has become a major issue of politics is precisely with LGBTQI plus rights. Whatever else we may say, that is about ways of being, of course. It is against heteronormativity, of course. It's centrally about sex. And that's actually one of the, the issues or one of the tropes that gets agitated in a very virulent politics of fear. Flavia earlier referred to the politics of fear. And, you know, I think that is a major modus operandi of the illiberal attacks on gendered rights. So what is all that about? It's about what I think of as the habeas corpus rights of women but it's also the habeas corpus rights of LGBTQI plus individuals, which come under a central attack. And it seems to me, just to say one thing about the question about backlash, I agree with you, Flavia, the backlash is not just responsive and it's not, it, it's, it is about an alternative political agenda, but in some sense, that alternative political agenda does have certain issues that it wants to centrally attack. And one of those issues has to do with the relationship between people and their bodies, in particular women and their bodies and, and, and the collapse of heteronormative standards of embodiment. So that's what I would say there. Thank you very much. Well, today we've been speaking about sex bodies, women from the alt right, politics of fear, so now we're going to the last question, which has to do with what what should we do <laughs> in this context? It's a question that has to do with us. So what role do you think that academic institutions, gender studies programs, gender scholars, and gender movements could play in addressing anti-gender mobilization and discourse or narratives? And what strategies of resistance and resilience should these organizations or could or should develop in response to these challenges? Again, feel free to discuss about one or more stakeholders or institutions. You can discuss about your own universities and positions or maybe go, go beyond that. So now I'll give the word to Jasmine again. So, so I, one thing I didn't mention because I knew we were going to talk about it now, is that a central element of the attacks has been actually on academic institutions. That's because it's an because illiberalism attacks universities. It has a strong, um, it has a strong anti-critical thought bias, which leads to attacks on on universities, and therefore there have been a lot of attacks on gender studies programs in particular. What is it about gender studies programs? It's that they're actually crucibles for the development of, if you like, advocacy, policy making, and cultural issue networks, and actually countercultures or critical cultures. So attacking them is a way of getting at these important crucibles for the formation of a feminist general consciousness that translates itself into advocacy, that translates itself into the policymaking of apparatus and into politics and so on and so forth. I'm sure we all have had students. I, so many of my students become advocates, become policymakers, change things in the world. And that's, you know, what is attacked when programs like ours get attacked? Mm. How do you resist that? 
I think is really the question. And it's important to recognize, and this is something that I learned actually from previous conversations in particular with Flavia, that institutional structures matter. So the vulnerability of the academia, of academia is going to be very closely related to the structures of different academic systems. And so for example, at Columbia, I'm like much less vulnerable than my colleagues in Florida. Nobody, I mean, I'm not totally invulnerable. And there are people who would like to not have gender studies programs, but on the whole, it's very, very different from being in a position where the governor of the state can decide that you're going. So, uh, so therefore also the means of the, the kind of resilience and the means of resistance are different because there are different things that you can do. It seems to me that there are two fundamental tasks in the face of resistance. One is the, pre the, pre the preservation as well as the pursuit of knowledge and therefore the creation of knowledge hubs that can survive independently of the attacks. And in projects that I've done, we, we've looked and talked at length to informal academies that have been formed outside of universities in contexts of repression. So you have to think about how do we preserve knowledge and how do we preserve cultural frames when the university is not a viable place in which to do that. Sometimes, you know, you can also just sort of go somewhat underground or do it as some people in some repressive context teach with a, they change the title of their course, but they teach very much the same thing. There are all sorts of ways, but fundamentally the task is how do you make sure that this enormous accumulation of feminist knowledge that we've had in the last 40 years doesn't get obliterated? Because knowledge can be forgotten. There is such a thing as the loss of knowledge. And so that's, I think, a fundamental task. The other that I think is a fundamental task is the creation of networks. I think networks are fundamental to resilience. There are many different kinds of networks. We can talk about how they work, what they do. But networks have ensure connectivity. They can help with the distribution of resources because repression is not the same in every place. And especially they are the, the embryos of institutional relationships when the repression ends. They're what's there when the destruction is over. I think, or at least I hope. And so I don't, you know, I don't want to talk in apocalyptic terms because I'm not, I don't think we are in the, in the apocalypse. I think we are just in a difficult moment and networks will be networks of resilience. It's important if I can invite endangered scholars to Columbia. It's important if somebody else can help to get books. It's important, you know, we, we actually in a network that I'm involved in, we had a meeting which was how do you distribute resources? Who has resources that they can share with whom? That's like a really concrete thing to talk about. So those are the two kinds of tasks that I think are most fundamental. Thank you very much, and I believe I will take this as a first step in a in a network that we all need to to build from feminism all, all over the the Americas. So now I'll give the word to Flavia. Thank you. So, well, I think Yasmin has like brought up all the the main points that I mentioned uh, when I think of how academic scholar networks could um, respond to uh, backlash and authoritarian politics. I, I will just mention also that one thing that we realized in Brazil as we were going through the, the attacks uh, of the Bolsonaro government, the far-right government against the universities, 
was how important our inter-universities, inter-regional, uh, uh, and I mean regions within Brazil also, and also the international networks were. Because like, I think that it was exhausting, but I think that one yeah. thing that we did was we never uh, let their actions become normal. Like the normalization of these actions is a risk in itself, as you know now in Argentina, as a, uh, if we think of Venezuela as well. So like how, how can contestation within very concrete networks play a role in not letting this uh, authoritarian kind of politics be normalized? So I would say this is uh, something that was important uh, as well. And we had very concrete networks that were uh, networks with judicial actors that allowed us to have very, uh, to very quickly react and denounce attacks, different kinds of attacks. So this also worked well because of course the judiciary was under dispute, but finding alliances in the judiciary was something that was very important during the uh, Bolsonaro government not only for feminists and for gender studies, but for the universities in general. What I think that I, I would like to maybe add is that um, the attacks against universities and gender studies, they come together with attacks against education in general, I think. Like schools have also become a battlefield, right? So why is that? What is like what is happening? Why have schools become kind of the central battlefield for cultural uh, battles? And I mean, schooling uh, in like more fundamental levels and of course not leaving universities aside. So when we think of universities, I agree with uh, Yasmin that it has to do with how we end up producing knowledge that is the basis for for, for intervention in real uh, societies in concrete situations. But when we think of schools, I, I'm also thinking of how they intend to control conduct. So by banning books, by censoring some discussions, by promoting alternative frameworks, the idea that it is possible to redefine conduct, starting from the young, children, from teenagers. So I think we are really facing a project of society that is imagining a kind of citizen, as I think that, I, I don't know if it was Yasmin that said it first, like they are trying to produce a kind of, uh, of citizen in a kind of citizenship uh, as well. And just to, to wrap up, it's not very well connected because Yasmin really talked about things that I, <laughs> I had thought of talking. And that, but one thing that I, I think that is important as well, when we think of the backlash against gender connected to democratic backsliding, connected to authoritarianism, is that uh, I think there is a risk for us as scholars that the backsliding weakens democratic imagination as we start like resisting by defending a kind of liberal democratic system that we have criticized it, uh, uh, very well from a feminist uh, perspective, theoretically uh, and um, empirically. So there is a risk that, that authoritarian movements and leaders capture the criticism of the limits of liberal democracy, although in tortuous ways, but I think that they have been doing that. So maybe like having in mind that uh, Analyzing these processes uh, is also analyzing what take us away further away from democratic politics, normalizing authoritarianism. But it's also like debating which normative perspectives inform resistance. Yeah. How are we resistant? Yeah, resistant. Right. What kind of criticism are we being able to bring out? And which are the horizons for democratization? How can we at the same time, discuss the attacks against gender, uh, 
and think of democratization in a more substantive way? way? How can we connect attacks against gender to the security issues that Veronica was bringing that I think are key to Latin America now? If we leave that aside, we won't be able to deal with authoritarianism and have a democratic horizon, right? So thank you. No, thank you very much, Flavia. Really interesting. And, and that word normalizing, I believe that it's something that we all, many of us, also the agenda have been thinking in the last in the last days, at least as from Argentina. So now I'll give the floor to Eleonor. Thank you. <laughs> Well, and both Flavia and Jasmine put a lot of ish, uh, ideas at the table, but I would say that I will take the idea of uh, not not being like stuck in the resistance uh, that Flavia stated, and I would say that uh, we have some problems in Argentina and at this stage. One is because I think feminists movements and academic, feminist academic, we were all very surprised by the rise of uh, this uh, libertarian government. It was very, very and we were a little bit more, uh, too much reliant in our first, uh, a little bit um, like naive in terms of if they could really get uh, gain the the elections, and I think this kind of leave all the scholars, but especially feminist scholars, in a bit of a, like a, a fog to to have some put together some ideas. Uh, yeah, to 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 think about the future, but nowadays I think scholars are like try, trying to strengthen a lot of networks. We all, we we have a lot of networks already. Different issues like abortion, sexuality education, care issues that I missed activists. We are also building some a lot of networks within the countries uh, between feminist activists, feminist scholars, and feminist grassroots organizations. And I think this is a very like it has a lot of potential. This this kind of uh, network, I would say that if at this point we consider and we are, I mean. And this is the, the discourse of the government, and I think it's a kind of um, uh, government uh, that they are considering that, that the, the purpose of this government is actually to refund the whole society and economy in a, within a context of very critical economic situation. And this is also uh, put as, a, as justifying the reduction of university and science budget, the, the demonization of public university and professors and researchers, in particular of those researchers on social science and more specifically those who study gender issues. And I think we, if they are putting or disputing the model of society, we have to be able also to dispute the model of society. And this is not only going to our very good, very well gained uh, rights uh, along these two decades or four decades, but looking forward. And at this stage, I would say that uh, taking that, Jasmine said that we have a, a risk of paralysis of the of the gender agenda at an international level. But in Latin America, there are what's a lot of advances. There has been a lot of advances in gender agenda, uh, focusing on care policies and rights. So I think one vision to dispute the model of society 
is really putting uh, care at the center, politizing care with a, from a feminist uh, perspective, from a gender perspective, and trying to build the very wide networks all within the country, but of course also with regional uh, allies and regional networks, which we have a lot to learn from other experiences and international networks. So my uh, well, my view is that we really have to look forward and to put care at the center of our uh, our fights and our proposals to really try to build a new, I would say, hegemony would be a lot, uh, uh, much, much, <laughs> too much, but a new sensibility, uh, a new sensitive around all, all this uh, humanity uh, aspects and humanity, human sciences. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Eleanor. So politicizing care for a new sensitivity. I like that. <laughs> That's a slogan. So now I'll give the word to the floor to Veronica. Yes, well, so many things that have been said here, but I will speak as an advocate too. So the, um, of course, universities are the targets of uh, authoritarian governments. So in Venezuela, that was the case. And um, university funding was cut completely, like uh, salaries of professors are like $50 a month. So that is one of the threats um, to resist and continue to advocate for um, women's rights. We were successful, some colleagues, in getting to a network that was, uh, that was called Network of Activism and Research. In Spanish, Red de Activismo e Investigación por la Convivencia. So we have been successful in raising international funds in order to resist in Venezuela. So at that time, we have we kept on documenting women's experiences in terms of the particular experience of victimhood. Also having a long term um, perspective, I mean, we are documenting human rights violation, violations with a gender perspective, hoping that what we are doing will contribute to the construction of memory and justice. But, um, and we are also working, some of us, in, hell, in promoting victims, women's victims organizations. Um, so, uh, but this is a perspective that is from below and it has a long-term um, perspective. So the idea of, uh, as uh, Flavia, Jasmine, but also Eleanor were saying, the, the fact of getting together and working in that network is, is a very strong um, tool. The problem is that also we become dependent on international uh, funding and assistance. So what happens when, uh, for instance, the situation of Venezuela or Nicaragua become a stalemate? international donors get uh, have this sort of fatigue or they get tired. So what we are dealing now, uh, scholars and um, gender uh, um, academics, is that some of, some of us has, has, I mean, we have had to leave the country. So the effort right now is trying to make this intersection between people that is in Venezuela, scholars that are outside trying to join efforts to have to continue this microscopic resistant, resistance with a long-term um, perspective. And I will leave it here because I know it's late. Well, thank you very, very much, Veronica. Well, we so far we don't have any questions in the Q and A uh, section, but we are already past the scheduled time, as as Veronica just said. So, once again, 
thank you very, very much to the panelists and all the participants, which most of them are, are women, as you noticed. So this meeting has been recorded, so we will share it with everyone later. And I believe we all leave this conversation feeling really energized to, to fight and do what we what we feel that we need to do in, in our countries and in our organizations. So thanks again. It's been a pleasure. And of course, I hope we can do something more with all of this that has been discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if any one of you want to add anything to what we I, I just wanted to add something to what Veronica just said about the foreign dependency. Because I think there's a problem of foreign dependency, but in the study that I did with my colleagues of the attacks on gender programs, what we also saw was the way in which illiberal governments' neo-sovereignism translates into bans, into prohibitions mm -hmm. against foreign funding. And then, oh, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And, and that's kind of of a piece with the attack on the concept of gender, with the xenophobia that is enmeshed in a, a kind of anti-feminism that sees both LGBTQI plus rights and women's rights as uh, as imports from colonial, uh, as colonial imports. And so the vulnerability is cultural, but there's also really a financial vulnerability because countries can limit the entry of foreign funds. Mm -hmm. That well, is why, actually, for I'm instance, sorry. that is why, for instance, in countries such as Venezuela, you start to have uh, this huge migration. Uh, for instance, in Venezuela, um, lots of scholars have left the country, but in total, twenty percent of the population have left the country. So this is like another step in authoritarian contexts um, that we are experiencing. Well, I was about to say, but maybe uh, Eleonor was about to say it too, that in Argentina, gender studies on papers uh, of gender study, the, the title are being used, you know, like fantasy titles about Batman and so on. They are being used to cut the funds in all the scientific and research system, you know, biotechnology, vaccines, everything. <laughs> everything is defunded right now. And of course, this, uh, all of these, uh, the gender agenda and social sciences agenda and humanities is being used as the excuse, you know, like everyone is, is paying, you know, like uh, with, with, with our taxes, we're paying you to do like, stupid things. You know, that's the, the kind of the, 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 the narrative. So, and, but, the, but the cuts are, are all over the, the scientific system, I believe. Yeah. Let's not forget that, you know, Macron also doesn't like gender studies. Yeah. I would say that from all of us, from all this uh, conversation, we kind of reaffirm that even if there are some uh, similar, very similar patterns in the gender attack, in all our countries and all these ultra-right movements, there are also some particular specificity in, in each country that needs to be uh, deep on, so as to know, I mean, to, to have more, uh, more acute uh, also answers in each country, because we can learn from one, one each other, but contexts are different, as Veronica was saying about migration uh, in Venezuela, the economic crisis in Argentina, the military support to Bolsonaro in Brazil, which is different from the situation of Millet. I mean, so there are some particularities that need to be strengthened also. And in our country, as Sol was saying, the all these gender studies were kind of justifying the uh, the cutting in the in the budget for science for university but that is very well grounded in society who is eager to find to see that the state is not anymore uh, spending money in uh, anything now so it's kind of figuring out all this in a very particular way in the context of a economic crisis but well we learn a lot from each other and we i hope we we go on on this conversation which was very very nutritive for me
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Also, I want to thank you, everybody, the guest speakers, especially, and everyone that uh, who is attending now. And we also wanted to uh, invite you to the next workshop <laughs> uh, that we will be organizing. That it's being it's going to be focused on uh, gender and health, menopause, and well, different uh, <laughs> topics around health. So we will go. We will uh, invite you by email and. Well, we hope to, that we uh, you can be with us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank bye. you very much. Well, bye bye. 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 Nice to see everybody. Thank you. You're the best. Thank you. All of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.